just want to say how encouraging it was to uh, visit Kids Camp uh, this week and just see the number of people from our church serving the kids so well. And, uh, you know, it's inspiring. I'd say that all around for our church, just to commend you. We don't often celebrate what God's doing through you and just commend you. But in all areas, I think of the student ministry camps that just happened too. Incredible. And uh, Real God, uh, another great week. So many lives touched. Sharing Jesus, it's what you're doing. Sharing Jesus through those videos. Uh, RealGod.info. So a lot to celebrate with what God's doing. I know people are talking about it's great weather and it's a great time of the year up here. But it's also a great time spiritually right now at the end of the summer. And so we thank God for that. We're in the series Joshua, so you could turn there in your Bibles or on your phone or any device that you brought today. Turn to Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to pray together as we jump into God's Word. Father, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. Lord, we thank you that your mercy is new every day, and great is your faithfulness. And uh, Father, we thank you that you strengthen us, sustain us. We just celebrate Lord, how you use us, even in our weakness, you're powerful. And uh, Lord, as we gather today, may we gather together and draw near to you. And we, may we listen close as you guide us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do something different today. At the end of this message, there's going to be an invitation, an opportunity to come forward. And two specific things. One, if you've never put your trust in Jesus before, and you've been thinking about that, and now you understand it's, it's a relationship, it's so much more than religion. If, if you're ready to do that at the end of the message, there'll be an opportunity to come forward. And then also, second, if you have put your trust in Jesus already, and you really sense that God wants you to take a step of faith, a radical step of faith in a specific area, and it's going to tie into the message, then uh, you also can come forward. And as, um, at the end of the message, when people come forward, we'll have a time of prayer, praying for those who have come forward. So either putting trust in Christ for the first time or sensing that this is a time in your walk with God where there's a specific area where God wants you to take a, a radical step in following Him, and you just want to affirm a yes to God by, by coming forward. So uh, as we do that, I mentioned the theme of this text is a radical faith. And another way of saying a radical faith is wise risks. Wise risks when we're following Jesus. So what does that look like? Now as we look at Joshua chapter 1, we're going to take a look at three different scenes and that golden thread is really the wise risks and the radical faith. So let's start in chapter 1 and drop down to verse 14. Now, here's the situation. There's 12 tribes in Israel, and there's two and a half tribes, the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Well, they could, in their inheritance, stay east of the Jordan. But all the people are crossing the Jordan, and they have a commitment there. Uh, there's a call on their lives, a radical step, to cross the Jordan and help the other tribes. So, it's played out here in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 14. Your wives, your children, and your livestock, okay, staying at home in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but now all your fighting men fully armed must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you and until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back Occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So that word rest, it's really a well-being. It's, it's a wholesome word, a well-being. Okay, you have your inheritance already, but continue so your other brothers and sisters can have their rest and well-being in the promised land which God is giving them. And so a key word is verse 13 is remember. Remember your brothers and sisters. Remember the other tribes. Remember that God is giving us all this land. Remember God and what he's asking you to do. Remember to be radical and be unselfish. Remember. So here's the first uh, principle. It's continually keeping in mind what is best for the entire group. What is best for the entire group? That's a challenge in our self-absorbed culture to continually have that be our mindset. What's best for the whole family? What's best for the whole life group? What's best for the whole church? What's best for the whole, you know, all my coworkers at work? What's best for everybody in keeping that in mind? Now in Louisiana this month, there's been a lot of rain. August 12th to 14th. It was recorded 
that there were four trillion gallons of rain that came down in the state of Louisiana in just a couple of days. So what did that mean? Uh, 20,000 people needed to be rescued. 10,000 people were offered shelter. Now there wasn't um, riots, there wasn't um, you know, plundering, but instead there was community coming together and people opening up their homes to total strangers saying you can stay here if you need to and here's some food. People are flying in from around the country to provide assistance. Some of the professional fishermen used their um, boats to go rescue people. They call themselves the Cajun Navy. And, and they would come in, and, uh, and I don't know what food was served, Cajun food on those boats, but they would come in and rescue people and help them. And, and what an effort. And again, there's the principle in a present-day contemporary example of thinking not just about ourselves, but our whole city, our whole state, who's in need. Let's think about it collectively. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Raul, I remember when he came to church a few years ago and he started to get on fire for God. And I just saw, you know, Raul in our life group. He's always thinking about everyone else. How could I serve? What food could I bring? Who needs something? Who needs prayer? And if you moved him to a different context, you know, he trains MMA, UFC fighters. And it wasn't just that training, but how are they doing personally? How's their walk with God? Do they know Jesus? And he would invite so many to church. You know, Raul had projects in his own home, but he would consistently put those on hold and he would go find a widow or find someone in need or go do more work at church and fix up, you know, the church building. And we don't want to have to remind him, Raul, you know, take care of your own place too. You know, you, you got to look after your own. But I just, she, he stands out to me in such an expiring example of somebody who's always thinking of others, putting others first, thinking about the group. And then you almost have to remind him, hey, what about you? You know, you, you got to take care of yourself too. Uh, so different examples, you might think of some people that continually keep the group in mind. The Gadites, the Reubenites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they're saying yes, yes to helping their brothers and sisters, yes to doing it wholehearted, yes to radical valor. Are there any areas where God is stirring you to say yes to radical valor, to maybe unselfish, all hands on deck? You say, well, is this a sacrifice? I mean, they could have just plopped down east of the Jordan, but they're going to risk their lives. What a sacrifice. That doesn't sound convenient. Why would they do this? We need to be reminded that in our culture, which, like I said, can be self-absorbed, love includes sacrifice. Love includes sacrifice. And that's going back to the cross. Jesus' love includes sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice. So let's not, you know, form, you know, views of love that just try to remove sacrifice and put me first all the time. For when we make the greatest sacrifices is when we often represent Jesus the best way. That's when people see Jesus the clearest in us is when we make those kind of sacrifices when we're so clearly loving everybody and then, you know, Ourselves, yes, love our neighbors ourselves, yes, we love ourselves, but let's not inflate ourselves. That kind of love and sacrifice. So that's a radical faith. Here's a second example, and let's turn to Joshua chapter 2. Now, this is a story of Rahab and the two spies. Rahab is a prostitute, and uh, two spies are going to come to her house. So let's take a look at chapter 2, verse 2. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the man who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But... She had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax. She had lay on top of the roof. So what was happening here? If, if you remember back when Moses was leading and they were considering the promised land, they sent 12 spies. Joshua was one of the 12 spies. Ten of the spies gave a bad report, didn't have faith, full of fear, and they uh, did not follow God. So Joshua was one of those with Caleb who said, yes, let's do this for the Lord. Well, now fast forward. Joshua's leading. Joshua sends in two spies this time. You know what he's thinking? Last time, we really only needed two. <laughs> Caleb and I had the report, you know. 
we don't need to be bringing along another 10. Have you ever noticed in life it's better sometimes to have two wholehearted than to try to carry along 10 more half-hearted and convince them and bring them along? And so he says, we're just going to take two devoted and there they are. Spies that go in. We're going to set limits on them. They go in secretly. And then we're going to get back and hear a report. So the spies go in. And uh, here's Rahab's uh, principles, what we see. She's living out her personal convictions. Even Do it even when you're the only one. And the risk is high. Live out those personal convictions with God, even if you're the only one. And the risk is high. So what did she do? It was harvest time for the flax. And you could picture with the stalks, about three or four feet long, and during harvest time, to dry out the stalks, they would put them on a roof, a flat roof, let them sit in the sunshine. Ideal place for hiding two spies. She hid the spies. Why did she do it? Protecting them, thinking about God, honoring God. She made a great move. She was full of faith and did that. Now, she also lied. And there's some interesting debates. Well, was it okay? Was it the greater good? Does God overlook it? Does God approve? Nowhere in the Bible, in the story, does it say God approves that she lied. Don't get fooled into thinking, oh, it's good to lie sometimes. Uh, no, that's not what we read here. So, you know, what was she doing? She was a little scared. She wasn't maybe trusting God. And instead, she thought, I'm going to take it in my own hands. And she tells a lie. Now, they believe the lie. It's part of the rescue. But could God have rescued them if she didn't lie? I kind of think so. I kind of think so. So when we're tempted to lie, we have to stop and think, am I trusting God? Because when we trust God, we speak truth. So trusting God, speaking truth, she wavered a little, but aren't we all growing? <laughs> aren't we all growing in our faith? I mean, she did the right thing in honoring God and hiding the spies. Okay, the lying was a little tricky for her, but we're all growing. And God sees her heart, and she's growing as well. So she risks all she had. She puts her life in jeopardy. The king of Jericho wants to catch the spies. And you know what she's saying? I have a new king in my life. Not the king of Jericho. I'm going to follow the king of kings. And so uh, she's honoring God more, even though the king of Jericho wants to kill the spies, and she risks everything she has. Do you know there's many places in our world today where when people put their trust in Jesus for the first time, they're risking everything they have. When they get baptized and the people around them in their community or family or, or country see that, they're risking everything they have. We might have a notion that, you know, risking everything you have for Jesus, that's only for seminarians. That's only for pastors. That's only if you follow Jesus for 30 years. You know, no. Risking everything she had instantly, right away, full of faith. It's a radical faith, but it's the same faith God calls us to. So how did this play out? Verse 11, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God, this is what Rahab's saying, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, and sisters and all who belong to them and you will save us from death. Uh, Rahab is demonstrating chesed, loyalty, kindness to the spies. She's asking for chesed, kindness, loyalty. She's honoring God and she's honoring the spies. She's asking them to honor God and honor her and her family. This chesed, loyal love that comes from God. Rahab is participating. She's asking the spies to participate. And so together we see this picture of loyalty. And Again, Rahab is freed. If you're caught up in, you know, what's everyone else doing? What's popular? What's the trend? If you're trying to overplease people, you will either end up paralyzed, frozen, or regretful that you didn't honor God instead. And so she's going to honor God. The way she's going to do it is there's a scarlet cord. She's going to put that scarlet cord. And so when they come in back into Jericho and they take over the land, they're going to see a scarlet cord. Say, so what's the significance of that scarlet cord? They're going to pass by her 
home. And Rahab uh, is going to get passed by. She's going to survive. And you might think back, uh, because the Bible's continuous, and the unity throughout the Bible, and the themes, and the ways God illustrates it. During the Passover, as Moses, you know, and they were leading out of Egypt, out of slavery, there was a lamb that was sacrificed. There was blood over the doorpost. And God passed over in that plague when he saw that blood of the lamb over the doorpost. The spies are going to see that red scarlet cord. They're going to pass by her home. And for us, we are forgiven when the blood of Jesus is uh, over us. We are forgiven because of his blood. In that sense, our sins, God passes by and forgives us. These pictures right here of God's great mercy. And uh, so they're going to honor her. Just note this, that her radical step of faith is going to have a great impact on her own family, mom, dad, brothers, sisters. It's going to encourage the two spies. It's going to encourage the Israelites in honoring God. When you take a radical step of faith, that impact, that God's going to use that. It's not just going to be between you and God, but it's going to impact a lot of lives like we see here in Rahab. So two strong examples of a radical faith. Now, here's the third context, and turn to Joshua chapter 3. As we move through the history of these scenes, and then we'll get to the application. Joshua chapter 3, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. Now after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, who are Levites, carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. And the principle here is embracing the goals and methods that God has clearly commanded. They're embracing both. The goal, getting into the promised land, and the method, how to get there. The ends and the means. Chapter 3, verse 1 starts out with the phrase, early in the morning. They are eager to honor God. Early in the morning. When God says jump, we say, how high on the way up? Uh, early in the morning, they're ready to honor God. And there's both personal and then there's group-wide things that God commands. And God's commanding the entire group to walk through the Jordan. Notice the ark, and God leads. The ark, which was the box in the holiest place of the tabernacle. The ark, which was, you know, described as holding the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, and, and the jar of manna. That ark right there... The Levites are carrying it because God says he wants the Levites to carry it. And the other people are, you know, they're there a thousand yards behind. Why that distance? One, respect and reverence for the ark, for God's presence, ultimately. But second, that's about the distance where most people possible could see and keep their eyes on that box and eyes on the ark. So they are watching the ark carefully. God is leading. The the leaders are there, kind of one step behind God, you know, one step ahead of the people. They're all united, though. They're all equal. And people are watching that box, watching the ark, saying, okay, we're moving out into the Jordan, and they're going to follow What a picture of unity. What a picture of finally crossing the Jordan. After waiting so long, what seemed impossible is now possible. God is leading, and and they're following. The ark, God's presence, and power. That's what's represented by the ark. And they are crossing the Jordan. Don't get this at flood season. At flood season. So this is a radical step of faith. Folks, when you've seen a whole generation not step forward in faith, and then you are going to say, yes, right now, we will, even though it hasn't happened in 40 years. It's a radical step to do that, and it's a radical faith to cross this Jordan. Now, um, in Kenmore Elementary here in Seattle, I was reading about one of the teachers, and her name is Kim Menon. And she was, you know, a self-professed atheist for 15 years, but she grew up Lutheran, Her father committed suicide when she was nine. And then she had many relationships where there was a lot of abuse. And so uh, she's at a very, very low point uh, and uh, suicidal. Now, there's a man, a Christian. His name is Andy Brown. And he's 
has a child in her kindergarten class, and so he's one of the dads. And he just noticed that the school needed a lot of help. Uh, so to help with some landscaping and to, to then find other helpers and help with tutoring in the class, I kind of think of some of the uh, things that are happening right now where our church is starting to help Terminal Park in that school close by. Well, Andy, uh, you know, he had a similar passion in his heart to start helping the school and following God's lead. It seemed kind of radical. We got more and more people involved, whether it was making copies, grading papers, but more and more people helped. And she saw this. Kim saw this. And, uh, you know, Andy didn't say much about Jesus, but eventually invited her to church, and she just said, no, no, thank you. But uh, when she started to go through some hardships, uh, she started to turn to that family. So when her marriage started to fall apart, she did start to ask Andy and his family, could you pray? And so uh, they started to pray. And when her mother was very, very ill, again, she went to them saying, can you pray? And she wasn't ready to come to church, but can you pray? And Andy prayed and others prayed and God answered that prayer and there was a miraculous healing with her mom. Well, she started to see daily grace. She started to see the love of Jesus. She started to see that these people are authentic, that these people are just here to serve. And it so impacted her that um, even though it took a long time, uh, eventually she was listening to some Christian music. She had been doing research on her own and listening to some Christian music on her own, and she was listening to some praise music. She made a decision to put her trust in Jesus. Kindergarten teacher here in Seattle, now sharing her testimony widely, uh, Christian Post and so forth. Uh, where it started with Andy's willingness to say, you know, I'll come alongside that teacher that's stressed. I'll come alongside that school. I'll serve. I'll build relationships. Why? Because, God, you want me to do this. And so it just grew. So as you think about Andy and his willingness, one aspect as we go through these texts is how is your willingness to be radical? How is it? And uh, I've got a little diagram up here that we could show on the slide. It's not that complicated, kind of simple, but I want to unpack it because there's a little bit to it. So when you think about following Jesus, for all of us, you know, it in should include some things that we might consider normal and some things that we might consider radical. So what would be in your normal area? Some people might say, uh, being kind, loving others, uh, maybe reading a little bit of the Bible or listening to a little bit of the Bible. And we'd say, okay, that's kind of some normal things. You know, you might think for me, following Jesus. You know what's interesting? As a culture gets further away from God, the things that we start describing as normal turn into radical. You catch that? So now, waiting for physical intimacy until marriage used to be considered more normal. Now it is so radical. Only 3% of people are really waiting to marriage. Tithing. Tithe just means a tenth. You know, you give off the top to God. Well, you know, average is about 3%. So to tithe is so radical. When, when I heard a pastor say, tithing's just kind of what we return to the Lord. Generosity starts after the tithe, you know. But again, that's so radical. Forgiveness. We should just forgive everybody fully. But in a culture that drifts, we'd say, oh, that is so radical to forgive everybody. Fasting. Jesus just said, when you fast. Well, fasting is so radical. Sharing your faith. You know, I, I heard this week from a pastor that 95% of Christians will never lead anyone to Jesus. You know, and, and most aren't that interested in sharing their faith. And again, sharing the faith becomes so radical. So when we open the book of Acts and we say, oh, normal, normal, normal in that community, now we say, wait a second, we're calling all that super radical today. So it's a shift in the culture. But I do want us to think about what is radical in your life in terms of following Jesus. We just saw the three examples here. Crossing the Jordan at flood stage, after a whole generation had said no, was a bold, radical step. Rahab saying yes to two spies in her house, even though she would die if those spies were found, it's radical for someone just turning to Jesus. Saying, I'm going to risk my life and set down all my comforts and all my home and my little family scene, and I'm going to cross that Jordan and risk my life, and I might not come back to my family, but I've got to help my brothers and sisters on the other side of the Jordan. That is radical. So where do we go with an application today? What's easy to do when you follow Jesus is say, there's my line. I'll do the normal. I don't want to do the radical. Right? I mean, have I done that? Have you done that? And we kind of say, that's my box. Not quite a box. That's my two-thirds circle. I'll do the normal. 
But the radical, that's for somebody else. That's for radical Christians. I'm a non-radical Christian. Thank you very much, and I take pride in that. Uh, so the question as we look through these stories is, will we open up and say, God, I want to say yes to the normal. God, I want to say yes to the radical aspects of following you where I'm way out of my comfort zone, and it's a stretch. So we're going to unpack in this last part adding radical to normal. What does that look like? Look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. We're going to focus on this crossing the Jordan. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. This is a radical devotion. Your devotion is rising as you enter into this new territory, this new season this new area where you haven't been before, but you're saying yes to that devotion. And that word consecrate just means set apart. Set apart from all the worldly practices and all the worldly attitudes and all the worldly thinking and all the stuff you used to do before Jesus and all the stuff God's you know, trying to pull you out of and all the stuff that Satan's trying to tempt you into and all the things that are not from God. Be set apart, pure heart, spiritual preparation. They had to walk seven miles from Shittim to the Jordan, but far more important than that seven-mile walk is the spiritual preparation. Would you take this time in the calendar year to begin to get spiritually prepared for the fall, for the fall in what God has? Uh, just set ourselves apart before the fall kicks in and school's right around the corner. Set ourselves apart. We're going to have a, a family time, a church family time, where we're going to have some prayer and worship to start uh, September, and then we're going to have some fellowship time right after that, kind of a family night and a Friday night. But think about this consecration set apart. God says, as you do that, I'm going to do amazing things. And a lot of you will say, yes, I want new victories from the Lord. I want God to do amazing things. But do I really want to consecrate and set apart with these new opportunities. God is trying to lead the people in an area they haven't gone to before. And Isaiah is so poetic. I'll read from Isaiah 42, 16. God says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn their darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, they will be turned back in utter shame. And in what God is, you hear the heart of the shepherd there. I will lead them in ways that are unfamiliar. New places, new ways of doing things, new patterns, new habits, new territories, new radical steps. And uh, can't you just picture, let's say almost two million people coming up to the Jordan River at flood stage at flood stage. And, you know, how many people are excited about that? <laughs> I picture more of, oh, great, flood stage. <laughs> great leadership, Joshua. <laughs> what was God thinking? Great, nice, flood stage. How many eyes start rolling, you know, back of the head? You know, flood stage, can't believe it. And what God's trying to say is it's trust time. It's trust time. And what you did in the wilderness is not going to work in this new season. It's trust time. And the Jordan at flood stage is the start of that trust. So get rid of idols and trust. Um, trust was really the essence for our family. You know, this is about 10 months now in Seattle. Love it here. So grateful for our church and the ministry. But it was a big step to leave a place in a church where we had been for so long and leave family around us. And it was just that trust. And when you're new somewhere, you're just reminded all the time because they have to ask. And people say, oh, have you, do you know where this is? Do you know about that? Have you heard about this? And you just have to keep saying, no, no, no. <laughs> No. And people refer to a certain place and they'll say, oh, do you know where that is? You know where that is, right? And I either have to lie, which it's not good to do, or I say, no, I don't know. 
tell me a little more. So it's just this continual learning when you're in a new place, in a new area, and that's God who has this fresh learning for the, and sometimes that's hard for, we get stuck in our ways and we don't want to be fresh and think out of the box or learn or follow him at a new time, but he's saying trust. Trust and don't retreat. When you cross that Jordan, oh no, it's not going back to the wilderness for 40 years. Trust and don't retreat. I think of the missionaries, the Moravians, who were known for when they arrived where God had led them, they would burn the boats. There's no retreat. We're saying yes to God. We're serving. There's no retreat. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said, whoever puts their hand to the plow and then decides to look back, they're not fit for the kingdom and for serving and following. Hand to the plow, cross the Jordan. Now we're not going back. We're not going back to Egypt. We're not going back to the wilderness. Um, Spurgeon said it this way. It's kind of a challenge. He said, you know, all Christians are either missionaries or imposters. Wow. Think about that, right? All Christians, wherever you are, you're either sent from the Lord, serving the Lord as missionaries, not necessarily your vocational missionary, but missionaries serving ambassadors representing Jesus. You're either doing that or some kind of imposter, he says. But that's our calling, to do that and not look back. So it's going to take trust, devotion, consecration, not looking back. And some flexibility, because couldn't you just hear some in that crowd saying, wait a minute, God's always shown up in a cloud. When we were in the wilderness, eyes on the cloud. That's what we watch. Cloud, 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 cloud. And now you're telling us no cloud? Ark? Ark? We're supposed to switch from cloud to ark? Huh. We want the cloud back. We want the cloud back. God, in a way, is saying, I was in the cloud, and now I'm in the ark, and it's both and. But it's not the cloud, it's me. It's not the ark. The ark is not a good luck box charm. It's not the ark, as some, you know, fell into that trap. It's me. It's me. So be flexible. Sometimes the cloud, now the ark, always me. Trust consecrate, devotion, flexible, follow. New territory, I'll lead you. So this is getting radical. Uh, look at verse 9. And Joshua says to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord. He's just trying to get them back to listen to God's word. Um, take it to heart. Follow it, what it says. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and he's going to drive out before you all these that are in the way. And that phrase right there in verse 10 is so central to this book. The living God is among you. That's why you're radical. He's leading you. He's among you. He's the living God. So what are they going to do? Uh, being radical is you pick up a ball that has sadly been dropped for a long, long time. Has any ball been dropped, maybe financially in your life, or a career, or spiritually, a relationship, a marriage? Is there some ball that's been dropped for a long, long time? And Joshua is a man of action, uh, and, and also you just think of the, Rahab is a woman of action, and a man of action, a woman of action, they're going to start to follow God, and, and Joshua in essence is saying this should have been done a long time ago, but we're going to do it now, no more wilderness we're picking up the ball. We're listening to the word. Pick up the ball. We're going to run with this ball. We're moving forward. And you know what obedience does? Obedience renews faith. If you've been rebelling and you receive God's mercy and you step into a fresh obedience, that's what's happening as I cross the Jordan, a fresh obedience renews faith because you say, yes, Yes to the Lord. And he builds up the faith and he builds up your confidence in him. And so that's what's being um, done right here. And this isn't the first time there was a great crossing. I like to use the phrase, the echoes of God. When they left Israel in slavery, remember what they had to cross? The Red Sea. And what did God tell them? Stand firm. Don't fear. They started to get stressed out. The Red Sea, it's big. It's, there's no way to cross. Here comes Pharaoh. Here comes the Egyptians. They were just stressing out. And God said, don't fear. Stand firm. Battle's not yours. You're going to see the deliverance. 
Oh, yeah, that's right. God's greater than Pharaoh. God's greater than the Red Sea. He's greater than my challenges. Oh, thank you, God, for that revelation. And I can calm back down. Uh, that's what he said. So when they get to the Jordan, it's at flood stage. What are we going to do? Calm down. Remember another one. God's doing it again. God will feed the masses 4,000. He'll feed the masses 5,000. God will heal this sick person. He'll heal that sick person. He'll raise the dead here. He raises the dead here. Uh, why does he keep doing that? Consistency. Because he's the same God. He can do it over and over. What we read in Joshua, he helps us cross the Jordan in our own lives. He's the same God. And all this is for his glory. This is not just about a group of people crossing a Jordan just for a while. That was cool. Flood stage, awesome. This is the living God among us. This is for his glory. There's progress, and it's for his glory. Why is there progress in our lives? For his glory. Why are we serving? Not just to do a little task over here. This is for his glory. And that's primary in this story. Now, uh, look at this last verse, verse 13. And uh, as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand into a heap. There's different descriptions about the width and depth of the Jordan River. Uh, not during flood stage. You know, some say maybe 40 feet wide in some places, 20 feet deep. Do you know that during flood stage, the approximation is a mile wide and 150 feet deep. <laughs> Pretty big change, right? So they're not crossing when it's 40-20. They're looking at 150 feet deep, a mile wide. Uh, have you ever kind of had a conversation with God and said, I'm not sure this is the best timing? It was a hundred times smaller about a month ago. It would have been a hundred times easier about a month ago. It was a hundred times calmer about a month ago. Did you lose track of the Jordan River schedule, God? This is a really difficult time to cross. And God says, take that first step. Trust me. Take that first step. But this seems impossible. What if? What if we step out? This isn't logical. We step into a flooded river as leaders. We're going to be looking foolish. You know what the people are going to be thinking? Why did you step into a flooded river? Duh. Wait. Later. What are you thinking? God's saying move now. God's saying progress now. God's saying trust him now. Well, how's it all going to work out when you step into the Jordan River? Don't have all the answers, to, but God's going to do it, and we're going to learn. We're going to be humble, and we take that first step. Um, here, here's the principle. You are way out on a limb when you have a radical faith, but you do it because your name is on it. You do it because God's word affirms it. Let me ask you, are you out on any limbs are you out on any limbs? Can you relate to this story where you just know it's kind of hard to explain what I'm doing? It's by faith. It's because of his word. You know, why are you passionately trying to make disciples around Seattle and the nations? Why are you doing that so passionately? Well, it's kind of in his word to do that with all our hearts. And it's what Jesus just kept saying again and again to his followers. I mean, I know it's cooler to not do it so passionately and just do a little bit and never step on a toe and but what does God say and so this is what they're wrestling with and and you know if your name's on it then you say yes to God we're securing him we serve him it's our purpose if God said it that's enough that's enough if it's in the book that's enough that's enough. God said it. It's time to cross the Jordan. Take that step. And you will stand strongest when you're in the center of God's will. The, the Levites, when they take that step into the Jordan River, they stand the strongest because they're in the center of God's will. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a flooded river. If you're in the center of God's will, you stand firm. You will never stand stronger. And when they take that step into the Jordan, they're basically communicating to everybody back here and around them and to God, we don't belong in the wilderness anymore. 
We don't belong there. We don't belong in slavery in Egypt. We don't belong there. And so radical faith, radical faith, and they step forward. Is there an area in your life, specific area, where God is saying it's time to take a radical step? You know, when I read Hebrews chapter 11, there are a lot of names there that are predictable. Abraham's there. Would have guessed it. Sarah's there. Kind of would have guessed. Moses is there. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing Moses too. And you keep reading Hebrews 11. You get down to 31. Hebrews 11, 31. All of a sudden you see this name, Rahab, a prostitute. Hebrews 11, that's the hall of fame of the faith. And the prostitute got into Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm flipping over in James chapter 2, and I'm reading about how she is full of faith and hid the spies. A prostitute now is being commended for her faith. I don't even know what it looks like to be a prostitute your whole life and then start to honor God, and then what's next? I mean, when you fill out the resume for the first job, well, you know, in the last 30 years, I was a prostitute. I mean, what employer is going to say, that's what we were looking for to hire? I mean, how do you find someone? Do you go online dating and Rahab says, oh, yes, I'm looking for a husband. I've been a prostitute the last 30 years. I'm just wondering if there's a good match out there. But you know what? There she is, walking by faith. God sees her potential. God sees her radical faith. He honors her in Hebrews 11. And, folks, it's more important our future than our past. Are you stuck living in your past are you stuck living in your old failures? Are you stuck back there? Rahab is saying, prostitute is not who I am. I am one who honors God at any cost. That's who I am. And he's the one who has my future. And by the way, when a Rahab is trying to make it out of prostitution, don't hold it over her head. Christians do that to other Christians. Well, I know you've been a prostitute the last 20 years. How could you even show up at church? How could you try to be in a life group? How could you try to serve? You know, couldn't you just hear Rahab getting all that business? No, it's what God sees, and God is at work, and he's leading her. And now it's a new season, and she said yes. They're crossing the Jordan. It's a new season. The take-home is this. A radical faith can only come from being radically loved. When you know the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and you are so radically loved, it's hard not to be radical. And you get secure in him and then you serve out of a place of security. But it starts with this great love that God has for us and we say yes. Hear this as, as, we, as we wrap up. I'm not minimizing the normal. Not minimizing. I've been through that stage. We've been through that stage where we're changing diapers all day long. Changing diapers all day long is for the glory of God. And it is marvelous daily grind and is not easy. But don't hear me say that I am minimalizing the everyday responsibilities and the small things. You know, parents with really young children, you're doing an amazing job just getting through the day and loving your kids and trying to get enough sleep and following God. So that's not what I'm saying in this message. I affirm the everyday faithfulness in the small things. Absolutely. But what this text screams is that our walk with God also goes beyond that into the radical areas of faith. And uh, this is what I, I want to highlight as we close. When you say yes to a radical step or an area where God is leading you, so often in Scripture, it's tied to one of the biggest breakthroughs of your life. You see, God will attach that big breakthrough, that promised land, to that radical step of crossing the Jordan. And so, in these areas of our life, if there's an area you've been holding back, we don't need to hold back any longer. You think about that circle, maybe you move the line. You said, I've only done the normal, I will say no to the radical. Maybe today we move the line and we say yes, looking at these examples and how God has worked in their life, we say yes. So, I'm going to invite the, the praise team to come back up right now. And uh, also, I'm going to invite the prayer teams just to come alongside of the stage, kind of where they usually are. And uh, this is the way we're going to do it. I want to explain it because we don't usually do this. And uh, the way we're going to do it is such. We're going to worship. The next song, we're just going to have a time of worship. During this song of worship and praise, if you sense that it's a time to come forward, you can come forward. You can talk to someone on the prayer team. You can pray with them. Or you can just come forward and you don't have to talk to anyone. But we're going to have this area here along the stage, an area where you can come forward during this song. Say, well, why come forward? 
Two reasons. I said at the beginning, two reasons. Number one, putting your trust in Jesus for the first time. Maybe you've been thinking about it, like that kindergarten teacher. You need to say, you know, today, I'm ready to follow Jesus, to put my trust in him. He died for my sins. I'm going to make that decision today. Here's the second reason to come forward. You've already made that decision to follow Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus. But throughout this message, and even before this message, maybe the last week or month, God has been uh, just tapping on your heart, saying, I want you to trust me in a new way. I want you to take a radical step in this area of your faith, of your walk with me. And this just gives you an opportunity to affirm that and say, yes, God, I know the area. I'm saying, yes, I want to follow you in a radical way. I don't want to do what the culture does. So there'll be an invitation, and anyone can come forward during this song for prayer, to talk, or just to stand. When the song completes, I'm going to pray. For everyone that came forward, I'm just going to pray over the people that came forward. If you don't come forward, you are no less spiritual. (laughs) If you come forward, you're no more spiritual. Some in their walks right now, it's just not a time to come forward. That's wonderful. We celebrate that. And would you just also, as I pray after the song, would you join me in prayer for those that have come forward? Uh, Let me pray. Father, during this time, we all worship you. We all celebrate what you're doing in our lives. We celebrate this text. And we also listen to you. And for those, God, who are going to put their trust in you for the first time to come forward today and have that freedom. For those who just sense that this is a time to take a clear step forward, maybe a radical step in a specific area, it's a time to say yes and come forward. So we worship you together now. We thank you for the freedom.